The first time user website basics webinar will provide you with a quick guide on how to access CBRN Responder, view event data via the data tables in event map, and navigate through the site for a user who just created an account. This webinar will serve as a quick introduction to the CBRN Responder website space for first time users. We will cover the most important aspects that someone who has never logged into Seaburn Responder will need to know, especially if they are thrown into the middle of an event. This includes, but is not limited to, the post authentication dashboard, searching for and opening an event, utilizing the event dashboards, viewing data, viewing the event map, and setting up your notification preferences. For more detailed information about each of these topics, check out the webinars focusing on these features in the resource library. We'll start by talking about signing in once your account has been approved. So after you submit an account request, you first must validate your email address for it to be brought to your requested organization's admin. After you click that link in your email, the organization admin will then be able to approve your account and then it goes to the Seaburn Responder team for a final review just to ensure that you meet all of the requirements and you don't already have an account. After those steps of approval, you'll be able to use your username, which is your email address, and the password you set at the time of requesting an account to log in. You'll navigate to seaburnresponder.net or either of the hazard-specific pages of radresponder.net and chemresponder.net. You'll click sign in in the upper right hand corner and enter your credentials and then click log in. Once you log in, you'll be brought to the post authentication home pages, which are known as the dashboards. And the dashboard will vary depending on which portal you log into. So this right here is the Seaburn Responder post authentication home page. This is the Chem Responder post authentication home page. And this is the Rad Responder post authentication home page. We'll talk a little bit about these homepage dashboards and what are the most important elements of each of them. The Seaburn Responder dashboard looks something like this, and the most useful information on the homepage dashboards are the 24 seven emergency support hotline number. And at the top, you can also see your most recently selected event. Those hazard specific icons on the left hand side are also going to give you quick links to the RAD Responder, Chem Responder, Future Bio Responder, and Future iMac Portal pages. Here is the hazard specific dashboard of RAD Responder. The Chem Responder one is going to look really similar with these various tiles on your home page. This events tile that you're seeing here is a quick link for you to search for an event. And on the left hand side, you will also see the quick access to the 24 seven emergency support hotline. You'll also notice that the top ribbon looks the same as it did on the Seaburn Responder homepage. And this is again where you can access your events and your organization space. At the top of your page, whether that be on the Seaburn Responder, Rad Responder or Chem Responder homepages, if there are any current active emergency response events, they will show up on the dashboard for you to either request access to, if you do not already have access, or for you to be able to select the event. Now it's time to actually access the event and search for it. So all data entered into Seaburn Responder must be associated with an event. So there is no rogue data that's just sort of in Seaburn Responder purgatory, it all has to be associated with an event. So in order to access the corresponding event to the incident, you can search by the event name. You can do this by going to the Seaburn Responder or hazard specific pages by either clicking the drop down box next to the event name and clicking search for an event. Or if you're on one of the hazard specific pages, you can just click search from the events tile. You'll use the search field to enter the name of the event. If you already have access to the event, you will see a select button, which will then allow you to open the event space. If you do not have access to the event, you will need to request access by clicking that green request button. And here's where you can request access individually or for your entire organization. To request access, you'll again, just click that green request button. And then you are going to choose if you're requesting access as an individual responder or for your entire organization. 
For each request form, you do need to provide a reason to let the event managers know why you are requesting access. Once your request has been approved by the event managers, you will get a notification banner, and this is where you'll be able to click to view the event to go directly to the event you were just granted access to. If you do not know the name of the event that you need access to, you can navigate to your organization space, which is that hierarchy icon, and you can click events on the dashboard. That will bring you to your events list, which you can see in the left-hand side here. You'll view all of the events created by your organization, and then you'll click that blue magnifying glass to open the details of that event. So on my left-hand screenshot, I'm clicking sampling training, and now, that I'm in the event, I can see in my event dashboard the corresponding name underlined in red. Now I'm in my event and I want to see what the event dashboard is going to provide me and as well as how to navigate through the event space. Once you open an event, you'll be brought to the event dashboard, which is what you're seeing here. And this dashboard is going to be a great way to get a bird's eye view of what's going on in the event, especially if you weren't there at the outset of the event. We'll look at this data graph here. So the recently collected data tile will allow you to choose a time range to show all event data collected within that range. So on my left hand side here, this is data collected within the last seven days. I can change that time frame from anywhere from the last five minutes up to the last 30 days. Here I selected last 30 days and you can see that only data that I've had collected um, was just in a few day range, which you can see by this graph. You can click on one of the points to see the number of data points that were collected, when they were collected and what type of data point it was. You also have a total data breakdown graph and this chart will show you all the different types of data collected on the event over the event's entire history. You see that there is a key, so for this example, we have orange as being dose readings, purple as being field samples, blue as being field surveys. You could hover over any of the sections to see the number of data points collected, or you can click that show as list button to be given a total data breakdown that's a little easier to read. If I scroll down on my event dashboard, I can see that there is a field team section. This is going to show me all the field teams on my event and their corresponding members and assigned equipment. And this will be really helpful for your situational awareness. You'll also be able to see the color of the field team if that has been assigned. If you scroll down a little more, you can see all pending and completed data collection assignments directly from this dashboard. And so this will help you know when to look for data that was entered via the assignment and if you're still waiting for pending assignments to come through. After you've taken a look at the event dashboard space to get uh, some bearings as to what's going on within the event, you can use the left-hand side navigation menu to navigate around the event space. The map and the data sections are what we'll be going over next, but you can open up the configuration menu to manage the details such as partners, responders, and assessment policies. You can create alert definitions, assignments, you can assign equipments. We also have reports that are generated by Seaburn Responder, and you can store documents in the event-specific document library. For a header that has a drop-down arrow, this means that you can expand it for more options. So this configuration menu, if I expand it, I can see here that I can view the details of my event, some assessment policies and delegates, facilities, GIS files, responders, teams, thresholds, etc. Viewing data is going to be the most important parts of your event. And there are two ways that you can view data collected within an event. You can do so from the data tables and from the event map. If we look at the data tables, this is going to give you more in-depth information about a particular data type. You can sort the data by collected date and time, by severity, by value, by units, etc. I can see here on my left hand side that I expanded that data menu and clicked surveys. I could also open up the details for any of the other data types as well. From my data tables page, I can view more information at a glance by clicking that choose visible columns option. This is going to present me with a variety of different 
pieces of information that I can select and deselect so I can customize what I want to see in the columns to view data side by side. If a column has the up and down arrow icon, this means that you can sort the column. And so depending on the column type, you can either sort the column alphabetically, chronologically, numerically, or by severity. This symbol here indicates that I am sorting the column in descending order, so the latest data point collected will show up first. I can also choose to filter my data to only show data that yields the filtered criteria that I select. I can select one or multiple filters. The results that I see are the data points that meet the set criteria. So for this example, I am searching for data collected by this particular individual. That's an alpha reading and has a severity level of medium, high, or very high. Once those filters are applied, I can scroll down to my data tables and see that only one out of the 29 total surveys meet this criteria. So here I have a high alpha reading that was collected by Kevin, which was the individual I filtered to. You can view the full details of a single data point instead of just viewing the visible columns. And you can do this by clicking the blue magnifying glass icon. Here you'll be able to see the general information, location information, survey information, assessment details, any attachments. And this is where you can edit the details of the reading and provide greater assessment. So that was the data tables. Now the event map is going to allow you to geospatially view the data to see visually where the high density data areas are and where the higher readings have been recorded. What you see on the map is based on the various filters that you have applied and the layers that you have enabled. The filters are going to work the same way they do for the data tables. You are paring down the data that matches your applied criteria. So this general filters menu is going to allow me to set filters such as a date range, who and which organizations collected the data, which field teams collected the data, etc. If I click my advanced filters, this is going to allow me to set more specific parameters for various data types, such as the assessment status, severity level, radiation type, etc. The map layers is where you're going to choose the type of data you wish to see on the map. Once a layer is enabled or toggled on, you will get a new menu for that layer to toggle on or off various layer options. So I have the event information, user collected data, GIS files, and 10 point monitoring plan layers enabled. Once I collapse my layers menu, I can see that I have corresponding menu options for each of those layers that I have enabled. On the right hand screenshot, I can see event information options, user data options, 10 point monitoring options, and GIS files. I can expand each layer menu for additional sub layers to toggle on and off. So for the user data options menu, for example, I can choose to only show a particular type of data so I can turn off analytical results and keep on survey samples and data sets. Once your filters have been set and your layers have been chosen, you're now going to see the event data that you need to see on the event map. To see which each icon and symbol and color represents, you can click Symbology at the top of the map and it's going to provide you with a key so you can understand each icon and what you're actually viewing on the map. For example, this data point here, this orange circle that has a two in it, the color represents the severity, so orange equals high. The number represents the number of data points in that cluster, so there are two data points. The outline represents whether the data point is approved, rejected, or pending assessment. And since I'm seeing a dashed outline, this means that the data points are pending assessment. A cluster is where data points are going to group together if there are a lot of data points in a very close proximity of one another. If I zoom in and zoom out, the data points will cluster and uncluster. You can click on your cluster to expand it. And this is where you can see the details of the individual data points. So in this cluster of three, I have two gamma surveys and one photo observation. If I click my gamma survey, that's yellow. It's going to give me the survey ID in the quick box that appears right above it, as well as the reading. And to the left hand side, I'll see some quick details. Part of these quick details that will pop up on the left hand side of my map include who collected it, when they collected it, um, any flags, severity, the reading itself. If I want more information, I'll click the additional details button to see more details on the right-hand side of my event map. 
I'll be able to see the general details and different tabs for assessment, indoor, and attachment. I can click that view full details to be brought to the details page that we saw previously from the data tables. Notification preferences are going to be really important, especially if you're a responder or part of a field team and you're going to be receiving assignments or alerts from the event. Like I mentioned, as part of being a Seabrain responder user, you may receive notifications relating to an event or your organization. A lot of these notifications depend on the roles and permissions that you have, but it is always a good idea to set up your notification preference to ensure you're receiving them in your chosen manner. Some of these notifications include, but are not limited to, alerts, data collection assignments, equipment maintenance, event access requests, organization access requests, and additional account information. Once you log into Seaburn Responder and from the upper right hand corner, you can select the drop down next to your name and then select notifications. You'll see a list of all notifications sent to you and the destination type. At the top, you'll see a blue button that says configure notification settings. Once you click that, you'll be brought to the configuration page. This configuration page is going to allow you to choose your default notification destination and you can also choose notification destinations by category. You can choose to receive notifications via email, push notifications, and or a text message. And you can also opt to unsubscribe for a particular notification. Here, for example, for data collection assignments, I am saying that I want my notification to be sent via push notification and via text message. It's important to note that you must ensure you grant the RAD responder, chem responder, and future Seaburn Responder mobile applications the permission to send you push notifications, and this is a device setting. So these screenshots here are just taken from an Apple iOS device, but you do need to go into your notification settings, open the RAD Responder or Chem Responder or Seaburn Responder apps, and ensure that the allow notifications option is turned on, otherwise you won't be receiving those push notifications. Lastly, as a first time user, it's important to know where to find additional information about the variety of capabilities and features. The resource library, which can be found from the top ribbon, is going to be a great place to find that information. We have user guides, job aids, how-to videos, and other tools. And again, they can be found in the resource library. As a user, it's also important for you to know that we do have a 24 seven emergency support hotline for real world incidents and exercises. The number can be found on our contact page. If you have any questions that are not part of an emergency, you can email us at support at seaburnresponder.net and one of the program support staff members will respond to you during normal business hours. And again, for more information on particular capabilities, you can visit our resource library from either Seaburn Responder, RAD Responder, or Chem Responder.